So, Doug Hemphill and Ron Bartlett, you guys are part of the dream team of uh, sound mixers and editors who were on uh, Blade Runner 2049. Um, approaching this um, sequel, highly anticipated sequel to a classic science fiction film, uh, what kind of pressure did you guys feel to, and uh, on the one hand, live up to the original, but on the other hand, make something new and unique? Well, I mean, uh... I, I think you probably know about eight years ago we worked with Ridley version without the narration on Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. that, and we were big fans before we even worked on that. So uh, to us, by the time we worked with Denis on Blade Runner 2049, the Blade Runner was in our DNA, permanently ensconced. <laughs> so, uh, I did actually want to ask you guys. It's been a long journey. Right. I did actually want to ask you guys, uh, you, you brought up the fact that you worked on um, the uh, final cut, which was uh, 2007. So, um, I mean, I guess it, it, it really has been. Uh, what, what were some of the experiences of working on that, and how did that inform your work on this one? Well, I'll, I'll just say uh, the best part of it was getting to work with Ridley Scott and hear stories of, of what it was like when he made Blade Runner, because we were right there on the lawn. I was just outside the stage and he spent many a night uh, discussing the film with the producer under that water tower so it was a it was a lot, a lot of fun because we're such fans. great hearing his ideas and what you know his choices and seeing where he went with that and taking those thematic elements moving it in to his in mind uh, especially the music I mean the music was a huge deal and that was also carried over yeah as far as the things that made it really give a nod to the original mm -hmm. so I, I often hear uh, from people people ask so what is the difference between sound mixing and sound editing right why are there two different categories if you guys could explain a little bit of what it is that you do exactly on a movie like blade runner 2049 what are your specific roles uh on a film Sorry. like this could you, you were cutting out but no, but I got the gist of the question. Um, I, I think it, that's a very good question. And in fact, what else did very much like audience members. You know, we go into a film and we look at the story. That's that's the most important thing, you know, thematically and whatnot. But we are essentially just like you. We come into a film, sit in this theater that looks like the theater you watch movies in and say, how... how would we like this film to, uh, you know, if this was our story? And obviously we get a lot of direction as well. Yeah, I mean, the key is to really grasp what the director's vision of the film is and really expound on them and also help character development, uh, overall mood, the, the arc of the film, and get the emotion right and uh, really make the most out of each moment. And the inner life of the characters as well. We're trying to express that. Mm -hmm. through sound depending on where they are and, you know and thematically again with blade runner for ron and myself uh themes like what does it mean to be a human being and what is an authentic person and it's powerful. i mean the story is really told through dialogue in almost every film not all of them uh <laughs> but uh, mainly uh it's that I, and we've told the word getting the actors intentions to really come through in the film and uh Everything else is supportive in that moment. No dialogue, and you can fill it with music and sound effects and all that, and it's really great. But when there is dialogue, we, we really kind of. And I have to say, uh, you know, in terms of a lot of people wonder what it's like to work with Ridley Scott or to work with Denis. And uh, they're both so blindingly creative. Uh, it's It's just so. They're such powerful, creative people. But to work with we had on Blade Runner 2049 was one where he included everybody in the room in, in the creative process. So that was uh, wonderful. Someone working with somebody like Denis, who, who really is uh, very inclusive. He won't compromise. He's, you know, he's <laughs> but he's, he's uh, we've really had a, a terrific experience. Yeah, I love the the fact that he allows you to bring all of your creative horsepower to the film, our ideas as well, 
but he definitely keeps his vision in mind and we obviously respect that you know over anything but he's very inclusive very collaborative and, and uh, it was a great group of people that work together to bring all of these great ideas into one solid thing for him. Going off of that, I mean, if you could talk a bit about what directives he gave you in terms of what he wanted, uh, what were his initial notes to you guys and, and how did that spark your ideas? I would let Ron answer that question, but I'll preface it by saying that Denis is obviously a very, very smart man. So when you show uh, like him, he's he's not necessarily going to explain anything to you because you know you're you're bright, you're going to get it and figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like that because doing that, he makes you bring yourself to the project, to bring your own heart to the to the story in the film. And I, I really uh, was impressed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he does like to see where thing, and then if you go in a different direction, he'll tell you. But um, generally, I mean, we were all pretty much on the same page there's a few times where he really wanted and thing like uh like the seawall uh for instance and that whole chase and then the fight you know and the walk he really wanted that operatic movement and uh fill it like never take your foot off the gas and so when we were you know making bigger moves he's like no i want the music to really play right through like one big movement and then everything it comes in concert with that piece of direction that, that gives you a real through throughput a thread through that whole scene uh, and it pays off in the end when it comes to the light snow at the end and of course in that same sequence um here's a really good piece of direction from denis and i've told this story before i apologize but it's, it's, a, it's saying to deckard you know at the seawall it's over they've they've uh you know gone to the shore and uh case and uh denise said to me uh doug it sounds a little bit too much like blue lagoon <laughs> <laughs> okay i get it i get it and so i went back to more of the dystopian i was trying to protect the dialogue but i went back to more of a dystopian sort of environment of blade or that more grit mm -hmm brutal quality it's a rough atmosphere and you know it's just you know not blue <laughs> <laughs> but yeah in that one sentence i understood absolutely what he meant mm -hmm. uh the film also uses sound very expressionistically can you talk a bit about that well, well it's um like the original blade runner there's sequences like bb's bar when you're down on the street and the blade runner world is different it's noisier down uh, on the street level. chaos, but it's orchestrated chaos. Every little piece is chosen. Uh, and to, to create Denise's world of a polyglot of languages and sounds and whatnot. Yeah, there was a lot of very, you know, tons of billboards and ads and you know, train announcer and the fan machines all going on. And uh, But it was very specific about which thing you heard when and how they overlapped, where they moved in the space uh but the, the whole, whole idea uh it's very chaotic very oppressive and just not a very fun place to be and as you you went up in levels ultimately on a roof or in wallace when he's way up top like that it was very peaceful and calming and we had that, that uh, slow chant uh you know the rain was very beautiful so it was a very you know thoughtful idea of saying you know it's the most oppressive down at the bottom and and just to be clear you know none of this is preordained no matter how much you think about stuff in advance it's not painting by the numbers when you get on the dub stage with the door with i think it's maybe 12 people maximum on the dub stage it just changes you start improvising you start doing things differently and a good example uh, in the music cue there that one uh, mix that was quite a uh, voyage of discovery yeah that uh did not start out that way at all there was a big music cue that carrie walks into the casino um mm. as we uh first played all the tracks you know the idea was to 
over Bill have a lot of choices and different elements and, and Hans and Ben did such a wonderful job of that. Um, Denis was very specific about the sounds he liked, he liked and he wasn't a fan of more of the, the more modern synths. Uh, so we would end up taking out some of those and he loved the CAS-80 Yamaha watch the sound of the original Blade Runner. Uh, but in that particular cue, he kept paring it down, kind of searching for something. It wasn't that the cue was bad, or, but he kept taking out tracks, take that out. Yeah, that one's great, but not in my movie. I, I, I love that sound, just not in this right here. So I'd take one. Uh, Denis, I've only got the big bass drum hits that, that I recorded for, you know, they were as not to the original Blade Runner played that scene with just those bang it would hit you know huge and then it goes down to like a very small light air and some steps and it would be and everyone's like oh man and that's where you are an audience member and you sit back and watch and go that's really cool it's yeah. so much fun to sit there and create stuff on the, our giant uh, etch a sketch <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can you talk about, I mean, you kind of mentioned this before, um, but I wanted to kind of dig into this a little bit more, um, how you create a good, clean soundtrack, a good balanced soundtrack when you have to have dialogue and music and sound effects and all this stuff working together. I mean, can you talk a bit about how you balance all that out? Well, heard it was clear density. It's a Walter Murch term where you have things going on, but you can hear through them. Um, you know, and, and it's, you may want to pick dramatically what the best thing to do is like, I may get out of sound effects completely when we're up in the spinner over the city going into LA, it may just be music. Uh, play what is telling the story. Mm -hmm. but that's the key line right there is you, you really zero in on what tells the story, uh, what follows the throughput of the characters and where the actors are going. Uh, and you have to get rid of other things you know, sometimes. Forming them and letting things speak, and other times is get rid of it if it's in the way. You know, you, you have to be very judicious that way and not be afraid. I will say about Denis is he is not afraid to be bold. He'll go there, and he wants you to go there, and it's just fantastic to work with someone like that, voices like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys both received an Oscar nomination for this film. Uh, it's not your first time at the Oscars. Doug, you're actually the former Oscar winner. Yeah. And uh, you're not? No, it's not the first time, no. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you, you said. Break it up and, no. <laughs> I thought you said, no, I never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, you have both. Uh, <laughs> I was like looking at my notes here. Wait a second. Um, so, uh, and Ron, you are a previous nominee as well. Can you guys talk a bit about what that recognition has meant to you in your career? Oh, sorry, say that again? Can you talk about what that recognition has meant for you in your career um, and also recognition for this film as well? I got, okay, I, I think I got it. I got both sides of it. Uh, it's always a fantastic honor to be recognized by your peers and by the academy like that. Uh, it means a lot, you know, because it, you, you, you try really hard through your hook, you get something like that, all the better. But uh, you know, I'm never trying to chase, you know, a, a gold statue. I think it's really great and all that, but I want people to move by what I do and the artist artistry that we put into things. Uh, that's what really gets me going. And I love that. It's a fantastic honor. The outpouring of people that give you congratulations and all that. It's overwhelming. It really is. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I'll tell you a corny story. Uh, when I won an Oscar, um, you know, my mom had sent me through film school at SC and all this stuff. And I, I never would have been a mixer winning an Oscar. Winner. And I, I gave her the Oscar. So that was a big deal. Uh, you know, she was my best friend. So yeah, yeah. I was I was very proud to give, give my mom the Oscar. I'm glad you were able to do that. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations on your work. Uh, it's a wonderful movie. Thank and you. thank you for taking the time to talk.
fans. Thank you, fans. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good day, gentlemen.